So, with that said, I, I'm going to go back and let's make that, let's talk a little more about why the energies of the Bohr atom uh, or, or of the you know, hydrogen atom have to be viewed necessarily as negative for things to work out. So, first of all, as we recall, one of the results that, that we drove, drove, derived, no, uh, from last time is that the, the energy levels for the Bohr atom are quantized. And specifically, they form a discrete series that we can map to the integers. And if you don't know what that means, I'll, I'll repeat it in exactly the same words. The energies of the Bohr atom form a discrete series that are mapped to the integers. <laughs> there, makes sense? Um, but no, specifically, it means that, um, and this is true for any, for any quantum effect, that the, the whatever the calculated values you find for essentially every single quantum thing that you, you will cover from you know, this point on through graduate level quantum field theory, you can always form a list and labeled with n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. So specifically, those energy levels as a function of n can be given by, now I will hardwire in the negative here, and then that's exactly what we're explaining, but as you recall, they're given by h c r naught over n squared. And the negative is important there. One other correction I had to make last time, and as I post-process the videos, I, um, I, I, I have, it's actually kind of hilarious, I have a whole series of corrections that I made, like when I realized that, oh crap, I said that wrong, I said that wrong. So I want to be clear, I did misquote the Rydberg constant. So, and, and I'll explain exactly the two things I did wrong. I originally wrote it wrongly as 0 0.110 nanom nanometers with everything to the negative first. Now that's wrong. I, there should not be parentheses. It should only be the units that are raised to the negative first. The, the constant actually is not. Um, so some of the miscalculations that I did, for example, for, for actually like the, the um, numeric value of HC are not, the reason why I was wrong and that was actually I was inverting that number, which was wrong. Secondly, this constant is wrong as well. There actually needs to be a zero there. So 0 0.0100. And really the best way, the better way to think of that though. So um, when we properly, properly write it out, this is fine, but to four sig figs, let's be a little bit more precise. And I will also convert this from inverse nanometers to inverse meters. So this is a proper way of writing it and seeing it, but more precisely, this is another way to see it. 1.097 times 10 to the 7 inverse meters. It, it's precisely the same where I've just done that unit conversion. Um, and again, remember that it's only the units that are inverted, not the numerical value. And then finally, with that said, once you do that conversion, now you find that, and then writing converting all of this into proper units of energy, this becomes, um, well, all right, H, C, R naught in units of uh, electron volts is, as we found out, 13.6 EVs. And I'm actually just going to label this as E sub one, because when you divide that by one squared, obviously, uh, that's what you get. Uh, and, and this I'll treat as the absolute magnitude. So given that, we can rewrite this as, and I'll put it up here now. Uh, actually, no, I'll put it down here. E sub n, we can now write much more compactly as minus E1, which is that value there, divided by n squared. So not only does this simplify it, but it actually, it, it makes it right, <laughs> which is the more important thing here. So, um, and I think sometimes you might see E0, um, either way, it's just the, the energy of the, gr of the ground state of hydrogen. And so here's where the negative comes from. So this will directly come back to, not, not come back to haunt us, but come back to help us, I guess, uh, later in the, later in the uh, lecture, because when we talk about uh, the Bohr atom, we do need to have the, the negatives and positives correct here for, for the differences in energy levels to, to come out. But let's consider the, the, the following. 
Let's say that you have a proton right here sitting in my house. And somewhere off an infinite distance away in the universe, so very, very, very far away, you have some electron. And again, consider this to be infinite distance away. And as I go through this, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll remember this a little bit from your physics to uh, E&M class. But what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the, the potential energy as we bring the electron closer to the proton. And um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 we're going to do it like this. So um, the electron at an infinite distance away, it feels no attractive force. So right now it's still, and if you just leave it there, it effectively doesn't have any attraction because it's so far away it's not feeling the presence of that. So I'm just going to give it the tiniest little tap to bring it that little, that little delta distance to bring it from infinity to a slightly less lower than infinity distance. So now it begins to feel the attraction of the proton. What I'm describing is physically impossible, of course, but just we'll roll with it. So all of a sudden the electron begins to very slightly feel the attraction of the proton. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to calculate the work that the proton does on the electron in bringing it closer. Now they're not going to collide. And, and so eventually what we're going to say is that we're going to bring the electron so close that it gets to the quantum mechanically closest distance that it can to the proton, and it will now just remain in orbit. And, and that's kind of what the Bohr model says in the first place. We'll, we'll come back to that. So let me write this up here. We're going to calculate the work done in bringing the electron to some given distance away from the proton. And notice that I have used the word a naught, or not the word, but the, the symbol a naught to describe the distance that we're going to get it away from the proton. So I will, I will uh, label that here. So again, the electron is going to feel an attractive force. It's going to speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up. And then now it's going to get to the closest distance that God will allow it or, or the, the, the rules of quantum mechanics. By the way, uh, just to be clear, I'm not trying to bring religion to this. I'm just using the word uh, God as a proxy for the laws of the universe. Um, if you want to think of it literally, that's fine. So we're going to bring it to as close as possible as we can, and I'm going to label that distance here A0. And that is typically the, the symbol that is used for this. And then now at this point, that electron will be orbiting with some velocity. And we'll actually calculate this in talking about the Bohr atom. So we now have the electron here orbiting as if it's a planet in a solar system type of system at some velocity v. So for any given distance r, and, and r is what I'm calling here, so let, let's, let's just randomly like imagine the electron happens to be at current a distance of r from the proton. So for any given distance r, the electromagnetic attraction, or the electrostatic attraction, I should say, between the electron and the proton is going to be given by this. The force as a function of R between the electron and the proton, I won't write that as a subscript, is going to be, and, and I'm just worried about the magnitude here, by Coulomb's law, K times the charge of the electron times the charge of the proton, divided by r squared. Hopefully that's familiar to you. 
And in this case here, since these are both elementary particles, we can set QE equal to Q, no, equal to QP, I, I'm being inconsistent here, whatever. And then we're just gonna call both of those simply E. Now, on the one hand, that's a little bit confusing notation because I'm using E minus as shorthand for the electron, but this is absolutely standard and this stands for the elementary charge. Which as you recall is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So this becomes Ke squared over R squared, which is quite simple to deal with. And now what I'm gonna do is we're gonna integrate this force across this distance, infinity to A naught. And that's exactly what the work we have done on it is. So this is a fairly straightforward, well, a, a very straightforward integral, where these are just going to be constants here. So I'll pull them out right from the outset. This equals Ke squared times the integral of dr over r squared, starting at infinity, ending at a naught. So hopefully you can kind of just look at this and do it. Um, so maybe just, you know, pause the video or just, you know, think for a second, write it down. But when you do this properly, this will look like this. I'll keep the constants outside. And the antiderivative of this is just minus one over r. And you can always check whether this is correct by taking the derivative. So if you take the derivative of this, you get out a minus one, which cancels that, and the exponent raises to two. So that's exactly what we got back. And that's good. And now let's plug in the endpoints. So here this becomes, I'll, uh, I'll pull out the, the negative sign, minus Ke squared. So remember I pulled that negative out. So we now just have one over A naught minus one over infinity. And as y'all know, Zero, so pretty straightforward. Minus Ke squared over A naught. So there's a negative sign which comes in and that's a really useful thing because that's where that negative sign comes in when we talk about the energy levels of the Bohr atom. And um, so, Recall, and this is kind of the last step along the way. Um, by the work energy principle, the work we do on an object, and specifically in this case, we're talking about the work that is being done to the electron. I'm pointing to E for, even though it doesn't mean the electron, but so, we're doing work on the electron, and we can set that directly equal to the change in energy, also of the electron. And if you recall, we started in a situation where, and, and let me formally write this, equals EF minus E naught. Where that, that's, uh, that, let me write it like this, EI, because we already have a naught in the A. But if you recall, we, we started and we established the fact that the electron was an infinite distance away and it was not moving. So you, you, no reasonable person can claim it has either um, uh, kinetic energy or potential energy. So we can just immediately set that equal to zero. And this is partly just by definition, the way we set up this integral in the first place. So literally the, the, the energy that the electron requires becomes negative. 
And that's directly where that energy of, of the Bohr atom being negative comes from. So this is where, um, and by the way, what we have just calculated here, I, I, I've kind of said this hand wavily so, but what, what I've said is that we're going to bring it to the closest distance away from the proton that God and or the rules of quantum physics allow. And so specifically what I'm talking about here is we are bringing it into the ground state, which we've already labeled as n equals 1. So this is where E1 simply just becomes whatever we just calculated there, which is minus Ke squared over that closest distance that it will get A0. And by the way, I'm intentionally not telling you what that is because this is something that we can and will calculate. Um, so I, I hope that gives a little bit more, more physical intuition of why we are forced to view those energy levels as progressively getting lower. Um, and by the way, if you think about it, um, <laughs> the, the way these functions work, and let me, let me graph this out just to be entirely obvious, if you graph the energy versus the, the distance r, the separation between them, now first of all it's negative and no values of, of r will ever make it positive. So this function looks like this. We're very far away. It's essentially zero. And I'll do it like this. It's essentially zero. And as it gets closer, it starts to get more and more negative. And it does, it, 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 it essentially goes without bound to negative infinity. However, God and or the rules of quantum physics come in to save us because there is some minimum distance that it's allowed to get. And that's what I'm going to call A0. And so if we kind of see what the value is right there, where that, where that hits that, none of this matters anymore. And so this would be E1. Then there's going to be some secondary. Uh, so by the way, this is for um, the other way to think of it. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll write it like this here. Um, let's set a not equal to, you'll see where I'm going with this. Let's set a not equal to R1, where they mean precisely the same thing. This is the standard way of notating it. This is the slightly more pedagogically obvious way. I think I use that word correctly. <laughs> um, but so let's consider now the, the distance at energy level two. So we can call that simply R2. Now we consider the distance at energy level 3. We'll call that R3. The distance at energy level 4, R4. I'm not trying to suggest that they're spaced exactly like that. Um, I'm just trying to show qualitatively what this is. So we can kind of imagine that. And here is E2. Here is E3. Here And so you see they're getting progressively closer together, E4. And obviously there's more and more and more. They do get closer and closer together, and the energy levels do get closer and closer together. So this graph right here, the vertical axis, is precisely that kind of like the elevator, the stair step model of the Bohr atom. And I'll just slightly more clearly indicate that. We have E1... E2, E3, E4, E5, and so on. So these are those energy levels, and they get increasingly closer together as we get closer to the, essentially, the infinite energy level. But they do go further downhill as we get to closer and closer orbital radii. This just looks messier, so I'm actually going to delete that after all. Actually, if you were to just kind of continue these lines, you get exactly that stair step model there. So, so, so I hope this helps to kind of answer that, that question that I think is a very reasonable question to ask. Why do they have to get negative? And one last thing about that. Remember, we said that the electron starts with no energy at all. Now, if, if we accept this as being true, 
if the potential energy becomes negative, remember we can always calculate the total energy of the electron simply as the potential energy of it plus the Ke of it. And this graph, which I'll make it solid now, and we don't need to worry about what happens past that limit, this graph right here is exactly what traces the, the potential energy as a function of radius. And if we accept that we began with zero energy, what we can say is zero equals minus Ke squared over R plus one half mv squared. And I'm going to leave it like this. We're going to come back to this exact equation later. But I want to make clear, though, that we now can actually parameterize the velocity of the electron in terms of its radius, which is not only cool, but it's actually absolutely fundamental for fully solving the Bohr, the, the Bohr model. So we can graph that uh, kinetic term as exactly the flip, the, the flip side of that line. So the kinetic energy term starts from zero, and it increases like that, roughly. So there's the Ke, and there's the Pe, and they are direct vertical flips. Uh, there's a mathematical term for that, but I don't care. Okay. Um, so, yeah, keep this in mind, and, and we'll, we'll come directly back to that. 